as I go around YouTube and I read about and, and look at videos about early retirement, it appears that early retirement or retirement in general is just the land of rose cookies and buttercups. But unfortunately, it's not that way for everybody. And today I'm going to talk about eight common mistakes early retirees might make and how to how to plan for those and, and, and navigate around those. But before I get started, I just ask that you if you find this information helpful or useful in any way, please subscribe to the channel. Please hit that like button. Let me know you're thinking of me. And if you if there's a piece of information that you have that you think can make this a better channel or provide a piece of information that people might be able to use, feel free to leave it in the comments. I read all the comments. I respond to all the comments and I, I take the comments very seriously. But on that note, let's get into it. So number one, um, underestimating your expenses. Failing to accurately estimate living expenses during retirement can lead to financial strain. This is a point in your life where you don't really want to spend time thinking about all the day-to-day -day, uh, things that you had to think about when you were working. This is a time where you're, you're living footloose and fancy free. And so one of the best ways to do that is to carefully create a budget for your necessities, healthcare costs, and your leisure activities. Figure out how you want to spend your time. Figure out how much it's going to cost you to stay healthy and how much does it cost for you just to live. Um, I get it. No budget is going to cover absolutely everything, but it can cover most things uh, fairly accurately. So I recommend that you put together a, a carefully put together budget and allow for it to change over time. Uh, number two, ignoring health care costs. Uh, health care expenses tend to increase with age. And early, and early retirees, retirees may not fully understand the impact of medical bills and insurance premiums on their finances. You'd be surprised at how many people I've talked to who don't who think, well, I'm going to retire and I'm going to go out and just be on COBRA. Well, what a lot of people don't realize is that COBRA usually is charges 105% of the plan premium. So not just what you were paying in terms of your premiums, but also the employer side, which for somebody in their 50s could easily be $1,500 to $2,000 a month. Whereas if you go to private insurance, assuming you're not eligible for Medicare, or if you go to one of the exchanges in your state for the Affordable Care Act, you might be able to find uh, premiums that are a lot less expensive than what you were paying uh, before uh, or what you would pay on your own through, through COBRA. So my recommendation is that you take a look at that and just shop around to find the best option for you. Again, if you're if you're eligible for Medicare, then Medicare is a route you go through, and there's a whole system for that, and we'll talk about that in a, in a later video. Uh, number three, neg neglecting inflation. You know, inflation has been a hot topic for the last couple of years, uh, just with the economy being where it is, but. We've always had inflation and we will always continue to have inflation. And so when you have a long retirement horizon, inflation really has the impact of eroding your purchase power over time. So make sure that in your planning that you account for inflation, um, usually two to 3%, so you don't end up with a shortfall in your funds uh, later on. Uh, number four, uh, being overly optimistic with your investment assumptions. It's interesting. I can always tell when people are writing videos or putting together videos because their investment assumptions closely mirror what's going on in the news. And unfortunately, investment returns and the stock market and all of these types of uh, investment informatics, they have a tendency to shift over time. Um, so there's people that if you retire today or yesterday, you find yourself in a, in a time in, in what they call a bull market where the, the market is just increasing. It's going up day over day. We might have some dips when somebody makes an announcement or something of that nature, but it's still up 14, 20, 25 percent over the course of the uh, uh, annualized where had you had the conversation, started the conversation two years ago 
in the middle of a bear market. And so you're losing five, 10, 15, 20% uh, over the year. And so when you, when you're putting together, uh, your investment assumptions, you should always put together something that takes into account the long term. Um, that takes into account the fact that some years you're going to have a 20 year, uh, 20% return. Other years, you might have a negative 20% return. Now, I'm certainly not saying that we should um, assume zero. But if you if you take a look at your investment strategy overall, really looking at what can I expect um, taking in all of those all of those years into into account um, and usually what I've heard it's usually about six about six to eight percent is what a person can do which doesn't seem like a lot when you're when you're looking for the flash and sizzle but it's a significant amount when you're looking at perhaps a 30 or 40 year uh, window of not having to work and being able to uh, live your life without worrying about finances um, and cover your expenses. So my recommendation is that you consider conservative estimates and, and you know, talk to a professional about diversifying your portfolio so you don't find yourself in a, in a difficult spot. Um, number five, withdrawing too much too soon. It's funny because one of the things that I think happens to a lot of people is when they retire, they look and they see this nest egg of X amount of dollars. And so the first thing they do is I want to pay off my car. I want to pay off my house. I want to pay off that new pair of Fendi shoes that I bought. Just kidding. But I want to pay these things off. They start taking a bunch of money out of their accounts. And then they run into an issue of, becoming down the road, um, heading towards a shortfall. And there's a thing that the financial advisor types talk a lot about, and it talks about the sequencing of returns. And so, and, and that really speaks to, if you take out a big amount and the market is on its way down, then it actually multiplies your losses. And it's a little more complicated than that, but the moral of the story is just be careful about withdrawing too much too soon and really think about a a withdrawal strategy that's sustainable. One of them is the the 4% rule. And so a lot of pundits, if you will, will say that if you have a 60-40 stock bond split portfolio, uh, you can ensure the longevity of your funds by just withdrawing 4% per year. Now, there are critics of that that are stating that that's not a sustainable strategy and that the market dynamics have changed and so on. So again, as always, I suggest you speak to a a professional that can help you navigate some of those. But if nothing else, just try to avoid taking out too much too soon so you don't find yourself in that situation. Uh, Number six, ignoring tax implications. We should always be mindful of the tax consequences of your of your financial decisions. Uh, you, you, when you take money out of tax advantaged accounts like 401ks and 403bs, uh, there's taxes for that. Um, you don't have tax implications for Roth withdrawals and so on, but there are different types of accounts where you get hit with capital gains. And so one of the things I suggest when you talk to your tax professional or you talk to your financial advisor, as they do the modeling for you, ask them to model out what your tax implications are going to be over time. So I could pull up now what my tax implications are going to be in 2040. Now, does that mean that the tax law is not going to change? No, tax laws are going to change. It could be higher, it could be lower, but it's not a matter of if they're higher or if they're lower, it's an understanding of what those implications are so you can adjust in real time so you don't find yourself in a bad situation down the road. So again, I recommend consult with a tax professional that's gonna really be able to help you optimize uh, those strategies. Uh, Number seven, a lack of an emergency fund or contingency planning. Uh, Failing to plan for unexpected unexpected expenses or market downturns can leave you vulnerable to to huge financial setbacks. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. There's always going to be something that happens. There's always going to be the car that breaks down. There's always going to be 
the bill that comes in that you thought you paid off. There's always going to be that time where something happens is going to cost you money. And what you, and if, as they say, if you if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So you should always have a contingency fund uh, on the side, uh, just as a backup. So you have that peace of mind because the one thing that nobody can take from you, people can take your money, they can take your cars, they can take your things. But the thing you have to hold in that special box is your peace of mind. And having an emergency fund really helps you with your peace of mind. Now, the amount of the emergency fund, it's like somebody asking how much you need to retire. It's different for different people. The question I have for you is what what amount of emergency uh, fund helps you uh, maintain your peace of mind? Because as long as you have that, life is good because all you really have is today. Um, number eight, um, underestimating your lifespan. We, a lot of us will look at our elders or our parents or people that are older than us and say, well, this person only lived to 75. This person only lived to 68. But when you when you really back up and you look at the data and you look at the advances in healthcare and longevity, um, you should plan for a longer retirement than previous generations. Now, I know there's people that might say, well, you know, with, with this, the lifespans have had this effect and this has had. And the thing is, I, I take it back to the basic question, what happens if I'm wrong? I would rather plan for a longer lifespan and have a little bit of extra money as I get towards the end of life than plan to live a short lifespan and run out of money before the end. Now, different people may have different views. If you feel different, please let me know. I'd be I'd be interested to hear your perspective. But at the end of the day, it all comes down. Uh, it all comes down to, to, to this. Taking a proactive approach to your retirement planning will help you increase your chances of achieving financial security and enjoying a, full, a fulfilling retirement. At the end of the day, it's about peace of mind. It's about being able to do what it is you want to do or doing nothing at all. Um, and there's a host of resources out there. Uh, I just looked at a website the other day, and I cannot for the life of me remember the name of it, but it helped me calculate what my, my health, uh, my, my lifespan was going to be based on different factors and so on. Um, you can talk to a tax professional. You can talk to a financial advisor. Um, but again, if there's, if, 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 if there's a professional out there to help you, um, my recommendation is that you, you get out and you talk to them just because they'll help you uh, understand information that maybe you didn't know existed before. So this is your main man, Sabado. Again, if you if you like this channel or you like the content or you find it helpful in any way, please like the channel, subscribe to the channel. I put up videos every week, Wednesday and Saturday. And so I look forward to speaking to you and hearing from you soon. Thank you.